Good evening, everyone. Glad to be here. Yeah, me too. Me, if, you are half as, if, you are, if you are half as happy to be here as I am, then you're very happy to be here. And I'm looking forward to this evening's presentation, the actual, definite, certain, unavoidable identity of the Antichrist. And as Paul has said, this is a very serious topic, but fortunately it is not one that is mysterious in the Bible. Many people have misunderstood who the Antichrist is. There's been a great deal of conjecture, a great deal of ideas and opinions, and, and everybody, oh, who could it be? And you can go to a bookstore today, a Christian bookstore today, and probably find five or six or seven at least different interpretations of who the Antichrist is. But tonight, we're going to go not to a bookstore, but to the most important book, okay? Does that sound like a good idea? And I will show you tonight from the Bible exactly who this Antichrist power is. And as I've already told you, I'm not going to tell you who it is. We'll put all of the identifying characteristics up on the board, and then you will tell me who it is. And I'm not just kidding. So let's get right into our message proper tonight. But before we do that, what will we do first? Pray. Pray. That's right. So let's do that together. Father in heaven, we come before you just now. We want to bow our heads and recognize that you are God and that you are the great teacher. Father, tonight we are looking at a very important topic and a topic that, as you know, has been very misunderstood. And so, Father, tonight as we go to your word, we pray that you would give us absolute clarity tonight. We claim the promise of 1 Corinthians 14 that you are not the author of confusion. And so, Father, tonight we are looking for Bible truth, not for man's ideas, not for man's opinions, not for man's conjectures. But tonight as we study your word, may our eyes see it. So please, Father, tonight give us spiritual minds that we may discern spiritual things. We're looking to you tonight as we open your word we ask that you would open our hearts and that we would have a crystal clear biblical understanding of this important topic. Be with us now, Father, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Take a look at that first paragraph there. Last, week, last uh, lesson we learned that the Antichrist is a subtle religious imposter, not a violent political opposer. He is a counterfeit more than a combatant. Paul referred to him as the son of perdition and the man of sin. That first name is used only to describe one other individual in the Bible, and as we've already said, that's Judas Iscariot. He was not an opponent from without, but a betrayer from within. Paul drew that parallel purposefully. In this lesson, we will identify the Antichrist from the Bible. We will note ten identifying characteristics from the Bible, and then we will draw the obvious conclusion. As you will see, this is really a very elementary matter. The threefold office of Jesus Christ. Open your Bibles as we begin this lesson now to the first book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, and we'll read our paragraph here. It says, As we learned last lesson, the goal of Satan is to obscure the person, place, and power of Jesus Christ. But what does this mean? How could Jesus Christ ever be obscured in the mind of the world, much less in the mind of the committed believer? In order to answer this question, we will take a look at the threefold office that Jesus Christ fulfills for the believer. In Matthew chapter 12, I wish we had time to spend a, a lot of time here, but I just want to direct you to three scriptures. Jesus is having an, a conversation with the religious leaders of his day, and he says something very interesting as people are listening in. We'll pick it up in verse 41. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. Actually, we'll pick it up in verse 39 so we set the context, okay? Verse 39, Jesus says, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Okay, he's of course referring here to the, the resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection. Now look at verse 41, Jesus speaking. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of who? Jonah, and I want you to notice what he says here, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Now, how many of you know the story of Jonah? That's a story that's well known to us, right? God said, go to Nineveh. And he said, well, you know, I'd rather go to Tarshish. And so you have this whole conflict playing out where he goes and the ship gets involved in the, the midst of that terrible storm. He's thrown overboard, a great fish eats him, burps him up on the land, and he goes and he preaches, and Nineveh repents. In the mind of the Jewish individual... Jer uh, pardon me, Jonah was one of the most powerful and successful prophets ever. 
I mean, think about it. You have the entire book of Jeremiah, and, and I can't find a single place in all of Jeremiah where even one person listened to one thing that Jeremiah said. Right? But Jonah goes to a pagan city, preaches for a few days, and the whole city repents. Is that a pretty successful prophet? And so Jesus says, hey, by the way, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus says, I'm greater than the most successful prophet. Okay? Look at the very next verse, verse 42. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon, Solomon is here. Who was Solomon? A third king. That's right, third king of Israel. He was the greatest king in all of Israel, at least in terms of wisdom and prosperity. And so in the mind of the Jew, Solomon is the greatest, and Jesus says, I'm greater than the greatest king. So I'm greater than the most successful prophet. I'm greater than the greatest king. Are we seeing a pattern here, yes or no? Yes. Okay, go to, go to uh, verse 6 of the same chapter. Jesus speaking. Matthew chapter 12, I'm in verse 6. Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Jesus says, I'm even greater than the temple itself and the priests that minister there. Of course he was greater than the temple. The whole purpose of the temple was to point to him. Can you say amen? I mean, you have the, the outer courtyard and the holy place and the most holy place. All of that pointed forward to Jesus. He says, a greater than Jonah is here. A greater than Solomon is here. A greater than the temple is here. I'm greater than the greatest prophet. I'm greater than the greatest king. And I'm greater than the greatest priest, even the temple itself. And here we find the threefold office that Jesus Christ fulfills. Jesus is prophet. Jesus is priest. Jesus is king. But he's not any ordinary prophet. He's the greatest of the prophets. He's not any ordinary priest. He's the greatest of the priests, greater than the temple itself. And he's not any ordinary king. He is king of kings and lord of lords. Now, right there on your sheet, you have that. His threefold office is prophet, priest, and king. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. What's a prophet? Right there on your study guide, a prophet is one who speaks for God. Is that true, everyone? Yes or no? You read the Old Testament, what did the prophets love to say? They said, thus saith the Lord. In other words, this is what God says. So a prophet is one who speaks for God. A priest is one who ministers for God. You'd write that right in your study guide there. A prophet is one who speaks for God. A priest is one who ministers for God, and a king would be one who rules for God. Okay? And so when we're talking about the Antichrist power, what we're looking for here is a power that would seek to overtake and usurp and obscure the threefold office of Jesus. Jesus said, I'm greater than the greatest prophet. I'm greater than the greatest temple or the priest. I'm greater than the greatest king. Prophet, priest, and king. One who speaks for God, one who ministers for God, one who rules for God. And the Antichrist power on earth is going to say, no, I'm God's voice on earth. No, 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 no. I'm God's ministry on earth. No, 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 no. I'm God's authority on earth. Are we all clear, everyone? So far, so good. So let's continue on here. Last paragraph there on page one. This is who Jesus Christ is. The Antichrist will seek to obscure or even usurp, that means take, these various offices from Jesus Christ. How very important, then, that we know who Jesus Christ really is according to the Bible. Can you see how essential it is to know, according, uh, know Jesus according to what is true? Remember, our knowledge of God and our worship of God must be in spirit and in truth. truth. Okay, very quick question before we go one second further. Does this idea make sense, everyone, yes or no? Okay, Jesus says, I'm greater than Solomon. I'm greater than Jonah. I'm greater than the temple. He's the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, the greatest king. So the Antichrist is going to try and usurp those offices. The Antichrist will say, I'm God's voice on earth. I'm God's ministry on earth. I'm God's authority on earth. That's what we're looking for. Okay, next page. Okay, the Antichrist. The name Antichrist is not used very frequently in the Bible. Only the author John uses it. However, uh, there are several different names that the Antichrist is referred to by in the Scriptures. Here are most of them. You can write them in there. 
He's referred to, as we've already said, the Antichrist. We looked at that in 1 John. He's referred to as the beast in Revelation, particularly chapter 13. He's referred to as the man of sin in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The son of perdition also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And another one that we've not talked about, the little horn, which is what we're going to spend some time looking at tonight in Daniel chapter 7 and 8. So there are several different monikers for the Antichrist. He's not always referred to just as the Antichrist. That's an important point that many do not understand. Okay? It says uh, the last one, number five, is found in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. So let's go to the book of Daniel as we begin to uncover exactly who this Antichrist, beast, man of, perdition, man of sin, son of perdition, little horn power is. We go to the book of Daniel, chapter 7. That's in the Old Testament. Should be able to find it. If you can find Isaiah, go forward, Jeremiah. Then you've got Ezekiel. And uh, uh, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Then you'll find Daniel, chapter 7. Okay, Daniel, what chapter, everyone? Seven. Seven. And here we're on the subheading, four frightening, ferocious, feral creatures. Okay? Let's go look at these four beasts. Now, before we do that, let's quickly review. Quickly what, everyone? Review. review. Now, we've seen this man before, haven't we? Okay, this is from Daniel chapter, who remembers? Daniel chapter two. That's right. And a king had a dream. What was his name? Nebuchadnezzar. That's exactly right. And he had a dream of a great metal man, the head of gold, the chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, long legs of iron, and then the feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And we saw that this metal man was a great timeline. A what, everyone? Timeline. timeline. Very simple. And so you can be filling these in here. It's, it's actually quite simple there on your sheet. Babylon reigned from 605 to 539 BC, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, the twin empires of the Medes and the Persians, 539 to 331. This is all review, by the way. Uh, Greece from 331 under the uh, 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 reign there, the auspices of Alexander the Great till 168 BC. Rome for almost 700 long years from 168 BC to 476 AD. And then, of course, divided Rome, which is the day in which we live today. Daniel said the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. This is Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter what? 2. Okay, so let's go to our study guide. It says God is the greatest teacher in the universe. And just like any good human teacher, he uses the twin teaching techniques of review and enlarge. You see that down here? Review and enlarge. You remember this. If there's any teachers here this evening, this is, this is one of the most uh, foundational teaching uh, pedagogical principles. And that is that when someone goes from the fourth grade into the fifth grade, you first review what they learned before and then you enlarge upon it. Then they go to the fifth to the sixth, you review what you've learned before and then you enlarge upon it, etc., etc. We all together, everyone? Okay, so in Daniel chapter 2, we have this timeline, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome. And so when we come to Daniel chapter 7, this is the second great prophecy in the book of Daniel, we find here this same idea of reviewing what we've been over and then enlarging upon it. Reviewing and then what? Enlarging. So you're in Daniel chapter 7 now with me. Okay, and we'll pick it up in verse... 1, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 1. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream telling the main facts. Verse 2, Daniel said, I saw in my vision be by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven were stirring up the great sea. So Daniel sees a frothy sea being whipped into action by the winds. And four great, what everyone? Beasts. Beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Number four. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it arise devour much flesh verse 6 after this I looked and behold there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird this beast also had what it was a very unusual beast four heads and dominion was given to it Verse 7, after this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge, what kind of teeth? 
iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, how many beasts, everyone? Four beasts, okay? The first beast was a lion that had eagle's wings. You can see it there on the screen. You can also see it on the banner. A, a lion with eagle's wings. The second beast was a bear that was sort of hunched up on one side that had three ribs in the mouth. The fourth was a strange four-headed leopard with four wings of a fowl, or pardon me, the third. And the fourth was an unusual beast. He doesn't exactly tell us what it was. He just says it was ferocious, it was terrible, it was horrific, and it had how many horns? Ten horns. And it had teeth, strange teeth made of iron. You've got it. Now, think about that. Four beasts, and over here, there were four main metals, okay? Those four main metals then gave way to feet of iron and clay. And how many toes do you have on your feet? Ten. Ten. And how many horns are on that beast? Ten. You've got it. And so what we're finding here is that God is reviewing what we've already learned in Daniel chapter 2. Okay? Now somebody says, Whoa, well, you're trying to tell me that these beasts aren't real beasts? How many of you ever seen a four-headed leopard? Anyone ever seen that? Or a leopard with wings? Or a lion with wings? No, 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 no. Now notice this. You're right there on your study guide. We're in the uh, bottom paragraph there. The very same timeline is spelled out in Daniel chapter 7. But this time, instead of using a metal image, God uses four great beasts. Are these beasts literal? The answer is no. Look with me. You're still in Daniel chapter 7. Look at verses 17 and 23. Daniel chapter 7, verses 17 and 23. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth. Notice verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom on the earth. So in Bible prophecy, end time Bible prophecy, a beast represents a kingdom. Does that make sense, everyone? Now notice that Pastor Asher didn't make that up. I didn't say, well, you know, what, what should we say these beasts represent? No, 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 no. It's right there in the book of Daniel. A beast represents a kingdom. Are we all clear, everyone? Okay, so far so good. Very powerful. So notice you'd write that in there, kings or kingdoms. Now, this practice of referring to nations as beasts is still common even today. For example, what modern nations are represented by the following beasts? Okay, the bald eagle would be United States of America. The bear would be, yeah, the former USSR. That's right. Turn the page over, okay, if you're keeping up with me there. The dragon would be, okay, there you go, very good. And the rooster would be France. France. Yeah, there you go. You didn't know that, did you? No one ever knows that one. I put that in there just because you don't know it. Now, it's very interesting. The beasts are symbolic. The beasts are what? And the beasts came up out of what? Do you remember? Out of what did they come out of? They came out of the great sea that was being frothed up by the wind, right? Well, guess what? The water is also symbolic. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. We're going to spend a lot of time in Revelation 17, but I'll give you one verse very quickly. It says, The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And so water in end time Bible prophecy represents a populated area. Now that does not mean that every time you see water in the Bible, it represents a populated area. No, no, no. In end time prophecy, water represents people. If that makes sense, say amen. We use that same language today. We'll say, oh, there was a sea of people there. Okay, that same kind of idea. So what Daniel here is seeing is four nations rising out of a populated area. Okay, if that all makes sense, everyone say amen. Okay, so far so good. We're doing great. Now let's continue on here. These four beasts retrace exactly the same timeline. I'm at the top of page three that the image of Daniel 2 did, but with more detail thrown in to confirm historical correspondence. So what we're going to find is that history hasn't changed. History doesn't change from Daniel 2 to Daniel 7. We still have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and divided Rome. But God here is now throwing in more details. More what, everyone? Details. details, remember? He reviews and then enlarges. You've got it. Now, the, horse, the historical correspondence here is absolutely incredible. The winged lion was actually one of the most sacred symbols in ancient Babylon. 
In fact, we, we showed you a picture earlier. Uh, this was uh, night number two of the great Ishtar Gate located in the Pergamon Museum, the very gate through which Daniel would have walked to stand before Nebuchadnezzar. And on the great Ishtar Gate, there were many different animals that were very symbolic and very important to the Babylonians. And one of them was a winged, guess what? lion. That's exactly right. And so a winged lion is represented. Of course, lion is the king of the beasts and gold is the chiefest of metals. And so here, just as Babylon was represented by the head of gold, so too Babylon is represented by this winged lion. Okay. Notice the next one. The chest of silver represented the great Medo-Persian empire. Okay. And so too here we have a bear. Now it's very interesting to note there were two elements of that bear that were kind of interesting. Number one is it was hunched up on one side. You remember that? Showing an imbalance. And that's exactly what history tells us. The Medes and the Persians had to league together in order to rule the then known world, but the Persians were always the stronger of the two. So the Persians were stronger than the Medes. The bear is raised up on one side, showing an imbalance. How many ribs were in the mouth? Three, three ribs, representing the three provinces of Babylon that had to be conquered. Lydia, Phrygia, and Egypt. Those were the three provinces of Babylon that were conquered in order for Medo-Persia to come to ascendancy. So far so good. Are you seeing the historical correspondences? Yes or no? Very powerful. Okay. Now, we notice the next one here. There was the leopard with four heads and four wings. And, and if time allowed, I could show you that wings in the Bible represent speed in prophecy. Wings represent what? Speed. speed. And so a leopard is already, the leopard, the cheetah family, a very fast land mammal. Very fast, very powerful, representing, of course, the great empire of Greece. Now think about this. Alexander the Great began conquering the then known world at the age of 16. And by the time he was 30 years old, he had conquered the whole then known world. Is that very fast, yes or no? So you have a fast mammal, you put four uh, wings on his back, you have a very rapidly moving empire here, just exactly what we see in Greece, but it gets even more amazing. Alexander the Great died in a drunken stupor at the age of 32. It, it, his last words were reputed to have been, the kingdom goes to the strongest. That's right, the kingdom goes to the strongest. And uh, because there was no heir that could just step into Alexander the Great's shoes. The kingdom goes to the strongest. So what ended up happening to Greece is they divided it, the Macedonian Grecian Empire, they divided it into guess how many parts? Four parts. And there were four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus, that all went to the north, south, east, and west, and the kingdom of Greece was divided into four. How many heads are on that leopard? Four. Incredible. Okay? More historical correspondence. Okay, but it gets even more amazing. The long legs of iron represented by this hideous, strange, ferocious beast that was crushing everything. In fact, this beast was so ugly, so terrible, so amazing, Daniel couldn't even think of anything that looked like it. He said it was a horrific, terrible, ferocious beast with teeth of iron that would correspond with the long iron legs. That's exactly right. Of course, the great iron monarchy of Rome. And then how many horns were on that final beast? Ten. And how many toes there? Ten. Ten. So you have the correspondence. Just as Rome broke down into those ten tribes, here we have Rome with the ten horns. Okay? So just as we have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, so too here Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Up to this point, we have no new information. This is all review. It's all what, everyone? Review. Now, I want to show you very quickly here a quotation that we've already shown once before. This was from Edward Gibbon, the secular historian. I told you that Edward Gibbon was actually quite uh, uh, disinterested in religion and was actually against uh, organized religion. But he himself said, as a secular historian, in his Decline and Fall of the Western Roman Empire, the images of gold, silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of... Rome. So even he could see that Daniel chapter 2 represents a timeline. This has been the historical interpretation. The what, everyone? 
And it's also been the correct interpretation. I want to show you something here that's very, very interesting. A friend of mine visited the courthouse in Nuremberg, Germany. Okay, this is an actual, this is the, the courthouse in Nuremberg, Germany, where many of the Nazi war criminals were tried in this very building. And above the two great doors is a very, two very interesting sculptures. And I want to show you amazing historical correspondence here. So if you can see here, just quickly, you have a, a figure here on the left and a figure on the right. Now, you can't make it out super well here, but on the right, that's Nebuchadnezzar with his long beard and his Babylonian garb. And if you look carefully, you see a lion with eagle's wings. On the left, you have a gentleman. You can see he's wearing a sort of a, a Medo-Persian outfit. Uh, that is, he has kind of the Persian headdress on there. And there's a bear. Okay, so let's look at these a little bit closer. Sure enough, there's Nebuchadnezzar and the lion with eagle's wings. Does everyone see that? Okay, now look at this. Here we have a Persian individual, a Persian soldier, and we have a bear. And if you look very carefully, I can show you a close-up picture. Guess how many ribs are in that mouth? Three ribs. Three ribs. Now here's another one. This is uh, the separate large door. And if you can look carefully here, you see Alexander the Great. None other than Alexander the Great. And that right there is a guess what? It's a leopard. Guess how many heads it has? Four-headed leopard. And over here, we have a... Roman soldier and a strange looking beast with ten horns. Here's up close views of that. You see that? Alexander the Great. Do you see the four headed leopard, everyone? Okay, you see the historical correspondence. And look here. Roman soldier, do you see this horrific beast? You see the ten horns here, everyone? Absolutely incredible. Now that shows you, in fact, I looked and looked and looked and looked and looked to try to figure out how old this building is. I don't know. The person that took the pictures told me the building is circa 1650 AD. Circa 1650 AD, now, I'm still trying to confirm that, but if that's true, that shows you that this idea, this interpretation is some 400 years old. This isn't something that Pastor Asherick just invented. People have historically seen Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Are we all clear, everyone? Yes. So far, so good. Now, you'll notice that this strange beast here has these horns coming up and if you look very carefully you can actually see there's a little head on this horn you might be thinking well where's there a head on that horn for well that's what we're going to find out right now go back to daniel chapter 7. back to daniel chapter 7. okay and we're in verse 7. very quickly let's read about this ferocious beast after this i saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And it had how many horns? Ten horns. Now look at verse 8. Here's new information. Everything up to this point is review. Is what, everyone? Review. review. But here's new information. Verse 8. Daniel says, I was considering the horns. Now if I say to you, well, consider it. What am I saying? Think about it. Daniel says, I was thinking about the horns. Something about that fourth beast and something about those horns riveted and arrested his attention. He said, well, I was thinking about the horns. And there was another horn, a little one. Do you see that, everyone? A little horn. That little horn is the Antichrist. Okay? Bible scholars are, are universally agreed on this. That little horn is the Antichrist power. Okay? Now look at this. A little horn came up among them, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great words. My Bible says pompous words. If you look in the margin, it says blasphemous words. Okay, that's why here on that statue that we just showed you, on those horns, one of the horns had a little head on it, and that little horn is the Antichrist. Okay, now let's continue. Verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, Daniel seeing all of this in vision. And the Ancient of Days, that's God the Father, was seated. His garment was white as snow, the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Here's God. A thousand thousands ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. This is a judgment scene. In verse 11, we'll spend a lot of time on this, but we're just going to go over it quickly right now. I watched because of the sound of the great words or pompous words which the little horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. 
So Daniel here sees in vision these four beasts. How many beasts? Four beasts. The fourth beast has how many horns? Ten horns. And he's thinking about those horns. Something about those horns riveted his attention, and he sees another little horn come up among those horns, and this horn starts spouting his mouth off. That little horn is the Antichrist. And what we're going to do is give ten identifying characteristics. You write them down in the corresponding verses. And you will see exactly who this power is. Okay? It's all right here in this passage. Here we go. Notice, first of all, the first thing that we need to notice is that it is a little horn. It is a what, everyone? A little horn. Okay? Actually, let's look with me just very quickly so we're clear on this. Look at verse 24 of Daniel 7. You're still there in Daniel 7. Looking for ten horns. No, no, no. The ten horns represent ten kings or kingdoms. Hey, that's exactly what we would expect. Because here you have Rome. Rome divides into the iron and clay, which are kingdoms. Are we clear on that, everyone? Okay, ten toes, ten horns. And so the first thing we want to notice is, number one, it's a little kingdom. Did it refer to any of the other horns as being little? No, no, no. But here it says a little horn. Identifying characteristic number one, it's a little kingdom. Okay? Number two, notice that it comes up among them. Did you see that in verse 8? Let's read verse 8 again. It says a little horn coming up among them. Coming up what, everyone? Among. among them. Now, among them. Who's them? Them is the ten horns, and the ten horns are the nations of divided Rome, or today what we would call Europe. So this power has to come up among the European nations. Okay? Has to come up among them. So if we're looking for the Antichrist to pop up in Tokyo, you're looking in the wrong place. It has to come up among the nations of divided Rome, what we today call Europe. Think of it this way. I'm not among you right now. Okay? I'm over here. But if I walk out into the midst of you, could you say now, he's among us? Yes. Does that make sense? Okay, so now I'm among you, okay? This little horn has to come up, what everyone? Among. among the ten horns, and the ten horns correspond to the ten toes. So far so good? Okay, number three. It has to come up after them. He said, well, how do we know that? Well, think about it. It's a timeline. The little horn didn't come up during the, the period of Greece. The little horn didn't come up during the period of Medo-Persia. The little horn had to come up after the dividing of Rome. In other words, in order to come up among the nations of divided Rome, Rome would have had to have been divided. And so it has to come up, if you want the date, 476 A.D. It has to come up after 476 A.D., sometime. If somebody says, oh, I know who the Antichrist is, and he came up in 233, wrong, can't be. It has to come up after the division of Rome. Now, the spirit of Antichrist was already working, as we've said, in John's day and in Paul's day, but it manifests itself here among and after the division of Rome. Number four, notice that it plucked up three horns. What did it do? Plucked up three. We'll come back to that. In fact, if you remember, it says it plucked up three by the roots. Now, what happens if you pluck up something by the roots? Gone. This horn was diverse or different from the other horns. You're still there in Daniel chapter 7. Look at verse 24. Daniel 7, verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom... And another shall arise, what's that word? After them. See, there it is. After them, he shall be diverse. My Bible says different from the first ones. So something about this kingdom, this little kingdom, is different. It's what, everyone? It, it couldn't be like all the other kings. Something was different about this kingdom. Okay, let's continue. Number six. This one, this kingdom, has a prominent man at its head. Okay, a prominent man at its head. You pick that up in verse 8. Daniel chapter 7, verse 8. It says, In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. So this horn has a prominent figure that has eyes that see and guide it, so a central man that guides it, and a central figurehead that speaks for it. A prominent man at the head. Number seven, this little horn speaks blasphemies. We've already seen that. In fact, it's several times here in the chapter, but verse 25 is the clearest one. Speaks pompous words against God. Blasphemies. Now, we should ask the question, what is blasphemy? What is blasphemy? 
People say, oh, blasphemy is uh, it's bad. Oh, no, no, no. Let's look at the biblical definition of blasphemy. I'll give you three verses here. In fact, you can write them down. I think it's, uh, there's not actually a place for you to write this down in your lesson, but you'll want to make note of this. First definition of blasphemy from the Bible, Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Speaking of Jesus, they said, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus claimed to be able to forgive sins, and the people of his day said, that's blasphemy to claim to be able to forgive sins. Was Jesus committing blasphemy when he said he could forgive sins? No, because he was God. But if I claim to be able to forgive your sins, the Bible says that's blasphemy. Okay, that would be... Now, if you steal my sunglasses and I forgive you, that's different. But if you steal his sunglasses and I forgive you, I'm, I have no prerogative on that. Are we clear? Okay, notice the second definition here. Speaking of the religious leader said, for a good work, we do not stone you. They were talking to Jesus. But for blasphemy, and because you being a man make yourself God. Because Jesus had said in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. Now think about that. Is it blasphemy for Jesus to claim to be God? No, because he is God. But what if I claim to be God? Would that be blasphemous? So definition number one, the power to forgive sins. Definition number two, claim to be God. Definition number three is if that's not enough. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, he says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. The Apostle Paul here refers to himself as a blasphemer, listen to this very carefully, because he persecuted the people of God in the name of God. You got that? That's another definition of blasphemy. To persecute the people of God in the name of God. So three definitions of blasphemy. Claim to be able to forgive sins on earth, claim to be God on earth, and persecuting God's people in the name of God. Okay, so those are our biblical definitions. What kind of definitions? Biblical. biblical. So let's continue. It's back up here. I didn't want to go there. Give me one more. Go back. Oh, you're so gracious. Here we go. Okay. Man at the head speaks blasphemy. It's a persecuting power. Look at verses 1 and verse 25 of Daniel 7. Or pardon me, 21 and 25 of Daniel 7. 21 says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against who? The saints. Who are the saints? God's people. God's people. So this war is make this little horn is making war against the people of God. Look at verse 25. And he shall speak pompous words against the Most High and shall persecute the saints, saints of the Most High. So this power has got to be a persecuting power. Okay? Number nine, this power will change or think to change the very law of God, the times and laws of God. You're still there in verse 25 of Daniel 7. Daniel 7, 25. It says, it says, shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and laws. Not some little city ordinance of Sterling Heights, Michigan. No, 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 no. This power would claim to be able to change the very laws of God. Okay? And then finally, this power would rule for 1,260 days. Notice it there in verse 25. Would change times and laws. Then the saints would be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Okay? Follow the math here. A time is one. Times is two. And half a time is one half. So that would be three and a half. That's what we talked about the last time we were together. So this power would rule for three and a half prophetic years. 1,260 prophetic days. So far so good, everyone? In fact, that time period, 1,260 days, appears seven times in the Bible. Five times in Revelation, two times in Daniel. It is the single most important, prominent time prophecy in all of Daniel and Revelation. Okay? You want to talk about prominence. Now, this is critical. A key that helps us to unlock Bible prophecy is that in end-time Bible prophecy, in what did I say, everyone? End-time Bible prophecy, a prophetic day equals a literal year. This is a time-honored principle of interpretation, okay? And I'll give you two verses there. You can write that down. Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34, okay? So a literal or a prophetic day equals a literal year. 
Okay? So when we're talking about this power reigning for 1,260 prophetic days, that power is really reigning for 1,260 literal years. And we'll show you that in just a moment. Okay, so the Antichrist, who exactly is this little horn? Did everyone get your, your marks all written down? Let's quickly review them. Number one, it is a little kingdom. Number two, it has to come up among the nations of divided Europe. Number three, it has to come up after them. Has to come up what, everyone? After them. Number four, it plucked up how many? Three. three, very good. Number five, I'm turning the page. It's diverse or different. My order might be a little different here. Okay, it's, some, it's different. Number six, it's blasphemous. Speaking the blasphemies, claim to forgive sins, claim to be God on earth, and persecuting the people of God in the name of God. It has a prominent man at its head. It is a persecuting power. It would think to change the very laws and times of God, and it would rule for 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. Now, beloved, I want you to think this through. First of all, let's be clear about something. Crystal clear. God is not against people. Can someone say amen? amen? God loves people. But God does not love systems that try to take away the kingdom of Christ and the prophet uh, status of Christ and the priestly status of Christ. So far, so good. Okay, so for example, uh, I happen to be an American here, and there's uh, no shame in being an American. However, as an American, there are certain things that America has done historically that I'm not very proud of. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. Any other Americans here want to say amen to that? I mean, come on now. You just look at our treatment of the, 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 the slaves. You look at our treatment of the indigenous peoples of this land. Now, the fact that I'm an American and the fact that America has historically done bad things, does that make me a bad person because I'm an American? No, 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 no. no. So notice, notice. My affiliation with America, my citizenship as an American, just because America has done wrong things does not mean I'm a bad person. Are we crystal clear on that? Yes. Okay, so God is not against people. God is not against people. Let's say that together. God is not against people. So if we put the, when we put this up here on the screen and everyone sees who the only power is that could meet these 10 identifying characteristics, incidentally, there are many more. We've just looked at 10 of them. The only power that could fit, if you say, oh, how could that be? I mean, I know someone who's affiliated with that system or I myself am affiliated with that system. Does that mean you're a bad person? Not at all, because God is not against people, but He is against systems. Okay, crystal clear. So, all of those identifying characteristics, who's the only power that could fit all of them? The answer is the Roman church state. Okay? The ecclesiastical empire of Rome. The only power that fits all of the identifying characteristics. A hand-in-glove fit the Roman church state. And I want to show you that in our closing moments here. Okay? Let's go through it. Does it fit? Number one, is it a little kingdom? Absolutely. One of the smallest kingdoms in the world located there in Rome. The Vatican is one of the smallest kingdoms. Does it come up among them? Does this nation rise up among the nations of Western Europe? Does it meet that identifier? Sure does. Does it come up after them? Sure does. In fact, the, the, the power, we'll show you this in a little bit, came up at about 538 A.D. I'll give you a quotation to that effect in just a moment. 538 A.D., so it meets that. Plucks up three. Now, some of this, it takes a little bit of uh, historical knowledge to go through, and I'll just quickly run through this. There were three tribes, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. They were Aryan tribes. That is to say, they denied the uh, preeminence of Jesus Christ. Okay, and basically what happened is the Bishop of Rome got on the phone to a man named Justinian, the ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire, and he said, I've got these three tribes over here that are giving me a hard time. They deny the teachings of the church, and what happened is, the short version is very short, Justinian came over and thrashed those kingdoms because the Bishop of Rome said they don't agree with us theologically. Those kingdoms, the Heruli, the Vandals of Northern Africa, and the Ostrogoths are gone today. No modern descendants whatsoever. None fits the historical correspondence perfectly. Is it different from the other kingdoms? Yes. This kingdom is a religio-political system. Okay, does that make sense? So France is a, France is France. It's a kingdom. 
Okay? England is England. It's a kingdom. Here, the Roman church state is a church, but it's also a kingdom. So it's diverse and it's different. Let me just quickly show you a quotation to that effect. This is taken from Alexander Clarence Flick, The Rise of the Medieval Church, page 168. The Bishop of Rome in the seat of Caesar was now the greatest man in the West and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. You've got it. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital, hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride, and sense of glory, and every social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city in the ecclesiastical capital. Civil as well as religious disputes, notice that, civil and religious disputes were referred to the successor of Peter for settlement. In other words, when Constantine took his empire and moved it from Rome to Constantinople, what we today call Istanbul, he had to leave somebody in charge. And who did he leave in charge? He left the Bishop of Rome in charge of that empire. And if you go today to the Vatican, you'll see the most, one of the most prominent paintings there is the donation of Constantine. I mean, we all should know that. That's basic history. And that's when Constantine basically turned the Western Roman Empire over to him and said, here, it's yours. And that's exactly what Flick is saying here. This is just basic history, basic history. Okay, does it have a prominent man at its head that speaks for it and that guides it? Sure it does. Does it speak blasphemy? Now, I hate to do this, absolutely hate to do this, because my own father is affiliated with this system, but my father would tell you that this is what this system teaches. So let's be clear on that. Let's be clear that this is from their own sources. I'm not up here blasting them. I'm not up here making fun of them. This is from their own sources. This is what they teach. Are we clear on that, everyone? Yes. God's not against people, and I'm not against people, but I am for truth. This is taken from Dignity and Duties of the Priest. Were the Redeemer to descend into a church, were Jesus Christ to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in a confessional, Jesus would say over each penitent, ego te absolvo, that's Latin for I forgive you, I absolve you. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, ego te absolvo, and notice this, the penitents of each would be equally absolved. Do you see that? So here's Jesus, he forgives John, and here's a priest, and he forgives Mary, and both are equally forgiven. Are we clear, everyone? Does that meet one of our biblical definitions of blasphemy? To claim to be able to forgive sins? Absolutely it does. Notice this one. This is from the Archbishop of Venice prior to becoming Pius X. The Bishop of Rome is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is... Jesus Christ himself, hidden under the veil of the flesh. Does the bishop of Rome speak? It is Jesus Christ who speaks. One of our definitions of blasphemy was claimed to be God on earth. This power says, we're God on earth. So far, so good? Okay. And our final definition of blasphemy, to rule for God, it, or not our final definition, but just another one that sort of lends itself to that, the great encyclical liter, letters of Leo the Thirteenth. he says on page 304, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. The Bible calls that blasphemy. blasphemy, okay? If I stood up here tonight and said, I hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, you want forgiveness, you come to me. You want ministry, you come to, you would call that what? Blasphemy. You say that, who, who do you think you are? That's blasphemous, I'll go to Jesus, okay? Speaks blasphemy, persecuting power. Just very quickly, W.E.H. Lecky, The History of the Rise and Influence of Rationalism in Europe, he said that the Roman church state has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. To the tune of a hundred million people killed during a period called the Dark Ages by this power. Okay? The Dark Ages. Part of the reason it was called the Dark Ages is that the word, which is a lamp under your feet and a light unto your path, was illegal. You couldn't have it. This book was kept in, a, in the Latin language. It wasn't the common language of the people. It was chained to a monastery wall or chained to a temple wall. Y you didn't get access to it. Are, are we clear on that, everyone? And if you did have one of these, you'd be persecuted. You could be killed for having one of these. Okay? Killed. Yeah, they come into your house and they see that you have it. You're done. We're very sorry. We're very sorry that you have this book. And, they, I mean, and killed in a lot of horrifically terrible ways that I just don't really want to spend time on. We'll talk maybe more about that in another night. Um, persecuting power changes the very times and laws of God. You say, no, nah, couldn't be. From Lucius Ferrara's Prompta Bibliotheca, an article entitled Papa, volume 6, page 29. The Bishop of Rome is of, is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, or interpret even what? Divine laws. 
Be clear on that. The Bishop of Rome can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God and he acts as the vicegerent or the representative of God upon the earth. We can change the law of God. Okay? The Bible says that he would intend... Now, can you really change God's law, yes or no? I mean, no. But the power... It doesn't say that this power would do it, but that it would intend to do it. Are we clear on that? You see the distinction there? Okay? And last but not least, that this power would rule for 1,260 prophetic days. And this is absolutely incredible. Listen to this from the History of the Christian Church, Volume 3. The Roman Church State's power became supreme in Christendom in when? 538 A.D. Due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian. That was the story I was just telling you about. After those three were plucked up, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths, Justinian issued a decree that the Bishop of Rome was the boss. Okay, when those powers were gone, there was nobody to resist anymore. So, due to a letter of the Roman Emperor Justinian, known as Justinian's decree, which set up and acknowledged the Bishop of Rome as the head of all what, everyone? Churches. Churches. When did that take place? 538 A.D. So, what happened that year? It gave the Roman church state political power, civil power, as well as ecclesiastical power. This letter became part of Justinian's code, the fundamental law of the empire. And that year, Pope Vigilius ascended the throne under the military protection of one of Justinian's generals, Belisarius. What year did that take place, everyone? 538. 538. Well, check this out. 1,260 years later, in exactly 1798, exactly 1798, do the math. 538, you move 1,260 years, you come to 1798. You say, well, what happened in 1798? I'll tell you what happened in 1798. A man by the name of Napoleon. You ever heard of him? He was essentially sick and tired of taking orders from the, the, the papacy, and he sent one of his top generals, a man by the name of Louise Alexandre Berthier, he sent him down there into the Vatican, and he went in, he took the Bishop of Rome off of his throne, he declared Rome the, the Republic, he all of the properties, everything, he declared it the property and Republic of France, and people said that's the end of it. That's the end of the Roman church state, it's done. And that happened in 1798, exactly 1,260 years after that power had risen to political and ecclesiastical prominence. Are you all with me, everyone? It's history, basic history. So there you have it. Does it fit? Is it a little kingdom? Yes. Did it come up among them? Yes. Did it rise up after them? Yes. Did it pluck up three? Yes. The historical correspondence is amazing. Is it different? Yes. It's a religio-political kingdom. Does it have a prominent man at its head that speaks for it and guides it? Yes. Does it speak blasphemy? Does it claim to be God on earth? Yes. Did it persecute the people of God in the name of God? Yes. Does it claim to be God on earth? Yes. Is it a persecuting power? Yes. Does it actually think it can change the very times and laws of God? Yes. Did it reign for 1,260 prophetic days or literal years? Yes. Are we all together, everyone? Now, I want to be crystal clear about something as we go to our sheet. You're all on your sheet here. Last page. Hear a pin drop in here. That's all right. God's Bible truth to embarrass you. Someone say amen. amen. God never sends Bible truth to embarrass. God never sends Bible truth to hurt anyone's feelings. God sends Bible truth because He loves you, not because He hates you. Think of it this way. What's the difference between a surgeon and a butcher? A surgeon cuts to heal and a butcher cuts to kill. God is a surgeon, not a butcher. Okay? God does sometimes cut us. Do we sometimes learn things in the Bible that cut us? Yeah. But God cuts to heal, not to kill. If God has sent you Bible truth, it's because He loves you, not because He doesn't love you. Amen? And I'm going to say it again. God is not against people, but he is against systems that obscure the place of Jesus Christ. Are we all together on that? And so look at there, right in the middle of that last paragraph. Sadly, this power has sought to usurp the threefold office of Jesus Christ. This power has claimed the prerogatives of prophet, priest, and king. It claims to speak for God. It claims to minister for God, forgive sins, etc., and to rule for God. In doing this, it has obscured the person power, and place of Jesus Christ. You are encouraged to do your own research on this subject. Don't take my word for it. Check it out for yourself. Reread and re read and reread the Bible passages that deal with the Antichrist and see if it isn't a hand-in-glove fit. Go to your library and see for yourself. Remember, Bible truth is never sent to discourage, overwhelm, or humiliate us. Amen? It is sent to save us. 
Keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ and His saving love. God is on your side. Can you say amen? amen? So in closing tonight, let's be crystal clear. Number one, was tonight's message clear, yes or no? Yes. Okay, you understood. You see the basic timeline. Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, and then divided Rome, and the Antichrist power comes up down in there. In Revelation chapter 7, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, the Antichrist comes up there. We looked at just 10 identifiers. Now listen, beloved, if time would have allowed, I could have given you 20 identifiers of this power. You go read Daniel chapter 7 and 8 for yourself, and you'll see there's many more identifiers that we actually didn't look at. The choice that faces every one of us today is the same choice that faced the people in the days of Jesus. And that is, is it Rome or is it Christ? Who is it? It's Rome or it's Christ? That was the same choice that Jesus faced. It was the same choice that all those people standing outside, they, they say, this is your king. And they said, we have no king but Caesar. They were making a choice. They said, we'll take Rome over Christ. What we're going to see as this Bible prophecy seminar continues to develop is that this is not just something to say, whoa, whoo, that happened. I'm so glad that happened back in 1798. What we're going to be seeing, especially over the next two meetings, actually all of them, but especially the next two, the rock that simply will not roll, is this isn't something that just happened all back then. No, 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 no. This is something that is happening right here today. Right here. What did I say, everyone? Today. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, what do you... You got to keep coming. You've got to see, not because I'm here. Listen, I don't get anything from you being here, but you get a lot from being here because the Lord is here. Amen? Amen. And so you come and you'll see from the Bible. From the what, everyone? From the Bible, exactly where this thing is leading. So number one tonight, three questions. Was tonight's message clear, yes or no? Yes. Number two, are you going to check this out for yourself and see if it's true? You check it out. And number three, if it is true, will you follow it? Yes. Okay, let's pray together. Father in heaven. We love you so much. We've presented tonight the very best that we are able, this powerful biblical truth that there is a power that would seek to take away the very prophet office and the priest office and the king office of our Lord and Redeemer Jesus. Tonight, Father, these are not easy messages to preach, but Father, you send us truth, not because you hate us, not because you want to humiliate us or overwhelm us, but because you love us. Tonight, Father, we've done our very best to present this, and I just plead with you on behalf of Christ that you will take this great truth, that you will bury it in the hearts of the people, and they will see, given the choice between Rome and Jesus Christ, I will choose Jesus by God's grace. And in his name we pray, let all the saints of God say, Amen. Amen.